show the bottom of the stage. Thank you. Yeah, you got me. All right. First of all, I want to thank everyone for taking this time uh, to come and listen to this. It's been an extraordinary event so far. Um, I want to extend my gratitude to Trescon and all of the event coordinators, because I know this is not an easy job that they're pulling off right now. So again, I think we should take a minute to just give them all a round of applause. I mean, they're working so hard, and they've thrown this on. It's absolutely amazing. So my keynote today is on exchanges. Now, I know we already had uh, Ted from Binance give a, a fantastic keynote on the cryptocurrency exchange landscape. Mine's is slightly different than that. I'll actually be addressing a much more macro view of how exchanges affect our day-to-day -day economic life. Exchanges have been something that us at our company have studied pretty diligently uh, throughout history. Um, almost going back five centuries is really when we looked at how exchanges will come to evolve and how a cryptocurrency exchange is a very particular type of manifestation of what an exchange was historically. So really, we're going to dive into that, and we're going to try to disseminate some of the complexities of what a cryptocurrency exchange should look like. And we hope to present an architecture that works not just for a singular exchange, but an ecosystem of exchanges, because we believe that the ultimate way that we're going to reach mass adoption is through a collaborative effort between exchange institutions who provide a very vital service to this marketplace. So to give you some background on who we are, in 2017, I co-founded a company with my good friend who's sitting in the audience, Mr. Warren Carson, called Invest Bank. Um, we are originally headquartered out of Toronto, Canada. Invest Bank was the world's first cryptocurrency banking institution that had physical branches. Um, we have a very diverse real estate strategy where we acquire former bank branches and we turn them into crypto banks. So we have an online software that's hybrid fiat crypto banking. We have an offline strategy that helps less technically sophisticated people onboard into this space. And so really that's our background. Why I'm up here talking about exchanges is because for the past 16 months, we've been working on an exchange operating system. And so we like to say that every advanced technology goes through a period where it needs to be, where there needs to be an operating system that emerges in order to solidify its position. And so with that being said, thanks a lot. Oh, I got it in my pocket. Let's rock. Are we live? Green. Perfect. So, shifts happen. And this is about to be the biggest shift of them all. So that's a little pun on the fact that regardless of where we want to be in an economic or innovation cycle, the market itself is going a specific direction. And typically incumbents, even new incumbents, startups, have a tendency to fall in love with their business model. They have a tendency to fall in love with the way they do things because it's worked so well. It's so profitable. Unfortunately, macroeconomic shifts the size of the blockchain don't care that much about that. So I love this quote by Alvin Toffler. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And if you really internalize that, what he's saying is, don't ever think what you're doing now is the way things are gonna be done in the future. You have to be cognitively flexible in business, in technology for sure. And so there comes a good friend of mine. This is Carl. You guys all know his last name, but you don't know his first name, and you have no idea what he's done. But I'm going to tell you a story about Carl. Carl created this thing. This is Carl's invention. What it's called is the Benz Patent Motor Wagon. And so Carl's last name is Benz, and he is the founder of a company called Mercedes-Benz, as you may know. What you may not know about this vehicle is that 
the Benz patent motor wagon launched in 1886 with a patent from 1885. It was the first production viable gasoline powered vehicle and it was the only non-horse carriage that actually rendered any commercial value. It sold 25 units at $1,000 in 1885, which is a remarkable accomplishment. And this is the stunning fact. It came out 22 years before Henry Ford's Model T, which sold a million units in the United States alone. So what went wrong with Carl's invention? If you guys had a chance to look at it, it's missing one very conspicuous piece of the vehicle. It doesn't have a steering wheel. So Carl's entire production model was built without an operating system. He nailed the technology. He was 24 years, 25 years ahead of Henry Ford. But he did not give people a way to use it that was that was native to the new technology he invented. And if that wasn't bad enough, he made it worse. He not only didn't give them a steering wheel, he, like other innovators in the automobile space, took his example for control from other artificial means of transportation. So what did he put in his car? A tiller. And unless you sail boats, you don't even know what a tiller is. A tiller is how people navigate sails in a boat when they're out at sea, like that. I have never seen one in my life. I would be shocked if you guys have. The issue with what he's doing is this. Forcing an old operating system on a new technology prevents adoption. It's not only that no one will buy it, it's that you are causing a mess. A mess that's not going to easily be rectified. And typically another incumbent comes along the way, understands what you're doing, and takes all of that market position. So let's look at technologies and the operating systems that have governed them and have allowed them to actually be used. The first one, we used the automobile. The operating system that was necessary was a steering wheel, were gears and roads. That's the OS that made the automobile actually tangible. It was not the combustion engine. Those are technical innovations that took place in a factory. The adoption innovations took place in the roads. Personal computers. Well, we're all familiar with MS-DOS, Windows, Mac OS, Linux. Without those operating systems, you could have the most incredibly sophisticated semiconductors that would mean nothing to you and money. This, the operating system, is currently the global financial system. And the global financial system is a composition of financial institutions. Today's global financial uh, system was set up after World War II using the Bretton Woods institutions. It's made up of banks, governments, regulators, investors, global supply chains that govern the way we use money. And that's the OS that we're familiar with. So if cryptocurrencies are to be a new innovation in money, are we to reuse the same operating system? And if not, which one will replace it? So we've, everyone in this room already understands what cryptocurrencies are going to do in terms of a medium of exchange. They are going to replace, if not supersede, and completely eradicate the use of fiat currencies, however long that may take. But how will you actually engage with them? That is a much more profound question that no one will talk about because it's a mechanism. It's talking about that that actually fruitates adoption and it's very difficult to pick. It's very difficult to pick. So this is what we study at Global Exchange. Global Exchange is a subsidiary of Invest. And we look at exchange operating systems as a mechanism of interacting with this new asset class. So we call this, we've jargonized this a little, it's called Exchange OS, like a Mac OS, Exchange OS. What is an Exchange OS? An Exchange OS is the system through which an individual interacts with their respective medium of exchange. Throughout history, there have been several exchange OS's. They might not have called them that, but that is exactly what they were. So let's look at exchange OS number one. I call it local exchange. 
This was the first, once we emerged out of a hunter-gatherer economy and went into somewhat of an agrarian economy, cultivating livestock, we started using bartering as a medium of exchange. You guys all well know this. And what this required was an operating system that was hyper-local. If you've ever heard in economics the coincidences of double wants, which means you have just magically produced exactly what the other guy wants, that's bartering. And that governed society for a very long time, and that it required people to live very locally. That is why we call that exchange local exchange. That was followed up. Oh, then what happened is complexity happened. I don't know if I could go back, but complexity happened. People started farming many things. They started cultivating many types of cattle, uh, many types of cattle and livestock. They had complex ecosystems. And when complexity ensues, we created a new operating system for money. This is called fixed exchange. This is what we've termed it. And this is asset-backed money or commodities. This is gold, silver, this is what the Romans used as like first iterations of banking in terms of coinage. This is the gold standard. This brought us all the way into the modern financial world. And why is this important? Because this allowed us to globalize. When you had a fixed operating system, a fixed medium of exchange, you were able to interact with many people that did not need or want the same things you had at that time. But then something happened. Globalization happened. And the same thing that fixed exchange allowed to happen ruined it. Because that's when we got Exchange OS 3.0, foreign exchange, FX markets, which is fiat money. So today's medium of exchange is fiat money. You guys know all about that. The OS that we use to regulate that is called foreign exchange. It's a collection of free-floating currencies that allow us to perform trade. And then are those currencies are, are rectify all the trade imbalances through these currency fluctuations. This is the modern financial system. And then something else happened. Not just one thing, three things. Digitalization, disintermediation, and the blockchain. So just when you thought we couldn't get any more fickle, we became more fickle and more abstracted away from the underlying asset. All these three trends happened at once in the last 20 years. Obviously, the most pivotal event with the release of Bitcoin with Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper. But then there's a huge problem. We haven't figured out what our next operating system is. We know the medium of exchange is gonna be cryptocurrency. That's a given. Anyone that has any rational trajectorial capacity to analyze the next trend will know that cryptocurrency is the next medium of exchange, whichever one you may choose. But how do you interact with that? What will be the foreign exchange markets for cryptocurrency? Will it be governed the same way? Well, if you look at the way today cryptocurrency exchanges are run, centralized or decentralized, they are trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. They are trying to take the principles of foreign exchange and run it into this new asset class. Now that works semi-effectively to onboard people because that's what they're familiar with. But does it work to scale? And does it work to solve the problem that we were running away from? And this is what we think the fourth OS will be, global exchange. And we use that term very cautiously because what it does, if you even think about the psychology of the literature, foreign exchange means you're interacting and trading with something foreign. In this world, there are no silos in asset classes. Like um, we were listening earlier, anyone can make a new asset class. Anyone can make a new exchange. Anyone can make a new marketplace. So you need something that's inclusive. You need something that interoperates. And that is what we call global exchange. The operating system, the mechanics, the exchange mechanics for cryptocurrencies. How does it look? This is what it looks like. Oh, can I go back? One slide back. Beautiful, thank you. 
This is a simple architecture document. It took us a long time to compile. That actually takes the principles of foreign exchange and disintermediates them. Now, this is the key point, and this is what I want to leave you off with, and this is what we're excited about. If you took the current crypto exchange market and you said, what happens when I click trade? No one has a good answer for that because most people don't understand exchange mechanics because you don't need to understand exchange mechanics to actually use an exchange. But what happens when you click that button is very profound because if you can disintermediate that, if you can decouple those functions into an operating system, now you can return the power to the consumer. You can actually say, instead of a FX model where custodians like exchanges take control of how you govern and interact with the cryptocurrency space, why don't we build an operating system that works for the end customer? or the end institution. So I will leave you off with this. You need to separate order books from custodians. So custodians cannot also be the ones holding your order books. That's a very unpopular belief, but that's just unfortunately how it is. And we could talk at a onerous length about why that's the case. You need to disintermediate money markets from custodians. Money markets are what allow the free floating exchange that we take for granted. And that's done here in this operating system. And finally, and this is the most important one, you need, you absolutely need to have unlimited choice as to where you're going to process your exchange. You cannot be siloed. If there are one million different, people say, oh, there's thousands of cryptocurrencies. When there's one million different cryptocurrencies, are you going to make accounts on 700 exchanges to be able to keep up with them? Are you going to lend your private keys to be custodialized by foreign, you know, foreign actors or whoever it so may be? All of that has to be rethought. And so we have built a model that we're releasing. It's called Global Exchange. It will be a protocol by which any exchange can interact with their end user and any user can interact with their exchange, leveraging the things that they like about them, like deep order books, fast execution, but res restoring order of the most important thing, which is control. See, I will finish by saying, the amazing thing that Microsoft and Apple did in the computing space is not actually build apps. They took apart the idea of a monolithic computing machine. If you guys remember, pre-Microsoft, pre-MS-DOS, you had accounting computers. You had supply chain management computers. You had computing algorithms and softwares for each purpose. And what MS-DOS and then Windows did is says, let's break that up and we will give it to the customer to use however they want. And that is what is happening now in the cryptocurrency space um, with a project like Global Exchange. So, if you want to learn more about what it is that we're doing, please come and see us. We'll be here for a little bit. Um, we are very excited about all of the happenings in Asia. We have quite a bit of infrastructure set up here. And uh, I would like to thank you. Wow, I finished two, two minutes before my time. That's a miracle. Thank you so much, guys. It's been a pleasure.